Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to start by thanking Patrick and Leslie for the invitation and giving me the opportunity to share with you some of our recent work on Huntington. In particular, today I would like to talk about uh, the new kid in the block, or what we call TPK1 uh, kinase, a new player in Huntington disease, which we believe could emer emerge as a potential therapeutic target for the treatment of Huntington disease. This slide is taken uh, from the CHDI website and highlights the different strategies that are being uh, taken today to lower Huntington levels and for the development of Huntington uh, lowering therapies. On the left, you see strategies based on targeting Huntington at the, trans uh, the transcription and post-transcriptional uh, levels. Today, I would like to focus mostly on highlighting and presenting some of our strategies aimed at targeting both Huntington aggregation and hunt lowering Huntington levels at the protein level. And our strategy for this is based on targeting uh, Huntington post-translational modifications, in particular in terminal phosphorylation of Huntington. Previous efforts have focused mainly on trying to promote the clearance of Huntington aggregates. Today, I would like to present to you a strategy where we can illustrate that a single approach can be used to both modulate Huntington levels and target soluble Huntington uh, for degradation, and thus achieving both lowering Huntington levels and blocking Huntington aggregation. The great majority of the work I will present today has been uh, recently published in an uh, EMBO journal. So I will focus mainly on the main findings of the study, but I would encourage you all to read the paper and all the supporting information for the detailed studies and, and uh, all the controls. This work has been done by a talented postdoc, Ramanath Hedge in the lab, who's currently in the job market. And if you're looking for someone, I would strongly encourage you to hire him. We first got interested in Huntington uh, phosphorylation based on the work of uh, William Young and colleagues, in which they had showed that mimicking interminal phosphorylation, i.e. by mutating serine 3, 13 and 16 to aspartate, was sufficient uh, to prevent the accumulation of mutant Huntington aggregates in the brain and prevent the onset of motor deficit and neurodegeneration in a back transgenic mice overexpressing the full length, uh, the full length Huntington protein. And we were intrigued by this finding that a, a simple mutation of two residues in a protein that is as huge as Huntington with more, more than 3000 amino acid would actually be sufficient to reverse the disease phenotype. And we had two hypotheses for this. One was that the possibility that this interminal segment of Huntington or in terminal 17 amino acid and exon 1 pack against the full length protein and act as master regulators of the structure and aggregation of this protein, or that these effects are actually mainly translated at the level of exon 1 and the interminal fragments. On the left, you see the structure of Huntington and as it's obvious uh, with HAP40, that the exon 1 is not even visible. So if we reconstruct or add in all the missing part of Huntington, the loops in exon one, you see that it's very, it's sort of, it does not appear to interact strongly, at least not in this three dimensional structure. So we focused our efforts on studying PTMs at the level of exon one proteins. And what we found it is that we have developed strategies that allow site specific introduction of all the known PTMs into the N17 domain and to our surprise, we found that most of these modifications actually inhibit rather than promote the aggregation of Huntington. And that suggests to us that this supports the data from William Yang, but it also suggests that these mutations are designed to keep the protein soluble and thus may be important in regulating its cellular properties, the interactome, and possibly it's uh, some aspects of its life cycle. So therefore, we wanted to find a way to modulate, to validate these findings in, in model systems, and thus we needed a way to modulate the, the phosphorylation level of Huntington. At the time when we started, the only kinase that was known to phosphorylate Huntington at this, le 
at these residues was IKK beta. And you could see from the left, the work from Leslie Thompson and Juan Stefan shows that IKK beta was shown to efficiently phosphorylate the wild type, but not mutant Huntington protein. And in vitro, it seems to also phosphorylate at one side. So it, for us, it was not the ideal kinase to move forward into model systems. So what we did then eventually did is we conducted an in vitro kinome screen in which we screened about more than 320 kinases using different substrates, including either the NT17 peptide or the exon one protein. And then, you know, we simply add the protein to these individual wells which have different kinases. Then we see where we see a phosphorylation signal. And then we determine by mass spec, validate the phosphorylation and identify the kinase. And in this assay, we identify TNK binding kinases as one of the main kinases among the top 20 kinases that can efficiently phosphorylate Huntington at both residues. As you can see in the bottom in the mass spec data, the conversion of wild type mutant Huntington, wild type means unphosphorylated here, into the diphosphorylated form is nearly quantitative. And we can validate this using phospho-specific antibodies against T3, S13, S16. And you can see here it does not phosphorylate at 3 neem 3 but only at S13 and S16. And this was validated by tandem mass spectrometry. We identified other kinases, but TBK1 was really the top one in terms of efficiency of phosphorylating Huntington. Now, TBK1 is a member of the IK-related kinase family, which includes IKK beta. They're all characterized by this uh, trimodular domain that has kinase domain, the ubiquitin-like domain, and the scaffold dimerization domain. And as you can see here, this is the overlay, the structure of TBK1 and IKK beta. And you can see that they have an overall similar structure, but different dimerization uh, uh, sort of interfaces and modes. And that is sufficient to give these two different proteins different functional properties in the cell and different level of activity against different substrates. So when we compare the efficiency of TBK1 to Huntington exon 1, in the left you can see IKK beta only phosphorylate uh, Huntington exon 1 at one, uh, at one site. It's, we only see mainly a conversion mostly to one uh, sort of a monophosphorylated form of exon 1, whereas in the case of TBK1, we see two phosphor, you know, the conversion into a diphosphorylated form. And from the kinetics of the reaction monitored by Western blot, you can see that TBK1 is much more if, if phosphorylate faster and more efficient than an IKK beta. And this is consistent with previous data showing that IKK beta phosphorylates at one side. Next, we can show that IK, uh, TBK1 can phosphorylate different uh, in-terminal fragment of exon 1. This is the exon 1 of, uh, of Huntington. This is exon, you can show here by Western plot that, again, TBK1 can phosphorylate IK, uh, exon 1 more efficiently than IKK beta. But we can also show that it phosphorylates longer fragment of Huntington, like the 5AD4 fragment as shown here by Western plot and by the single X assay. And it also phosphorylated S13, the TBK1 and kinase, uh, sort of the, the, the full length protein as determined by Western single X assay. Unfortunately, in the Western blots, we're only able to monitor phosphorylation at S13 because the S16 antibodies do not work as well. Now that we know that it phosphorylates uh, these proteins, if Efficiently, we went down to test whether this phosphorylation is sufficient to block Huntington aggregation in different cellular and different model systems. We use the HEC model system, which is a model system where overexpression of Huntington results in the rapid accumulation of these inclusions. And in the system, we typically observe about in cells that shows inclusion 90% cytoplasmic and 10% nuclear inclusions. And we've also tested uh, in primary neurons where the, we see predominantly nuclear inclusion, but we could also detect about 5% of neurons that show Huntington inclusions have nuclear inclusions. Thus, we're able to look at the effect of TBK1 on both cytoplasmic and nuclear Huntington inclusions. 
Finally, we also test the effect and aggregation using a C elegance model that was kindly provided by Elise, uh, Professor Kikis. Here is the data, and here what we can show is that clearly TBK1 co-expression with mutant Huntington, when we have the only empty vector, we can see the extensive formation of Huntington inclusions that are quantified here for cytoplasmic and nuclear. And you could see when we overexpress TBK1, we see a dramatic reduction in the number of cells were Huntington inclusion both in the cytosol and in the nucleus. And similarly, in the C. elegans model, we see significant reduction of the number of the mutant Huntington uh, inclusion formation. So this data shows that TBK1 expression is sufficient, sort of in, uh, reduces the number of inclusion formation in this model. Next, in collaboration with Chris Ross, we looked at the effect of TBK1 in Huntington toxicity. And what you could show here clearly is that this is in a neuronal um, uh, toxicity model that overexpresses the 586 uh, mutant of Huntington. And we see when we overexpress simply uh, Huntington, we see about 40% cell death. And when we co-express with TBK1, we see a rapid reduction. So we see a significant reduction that is not seen with the kinase deficient mutant. Moreover, when we now to inhibit exon one by adding, the, sorry, TPK1 by adding TPK1 inhibitors, we can revert, reverse the protective effect of uh, TPK1. Again, this data shows that uh, TPK1 lowers Huntington aggregation levels and protects against hun mutant Huntington induced toxicity in this primary neuronal model. We also looked at uh, sort of uh, looked at this in the C. elegans model, and here we looked at two phenotype worm mobility. We know that the formation of these inclusions sort of slows the mobility of these neurons. And what you could see here again is that when we overexpress the TBK1 in worms that express the mutant Huntington, we see uh, uh, that these were more faster compared to the ones that only express the kinase deficient mutant. And when we look at life effect of TBK1 on lifespan, this is what you see here. We can see that expression of TBK1 sort of uh, prolongs the lifespan of these worms compared to the kinase deficient mutant, which is shown here in red. And, uh, you can see that the, T, the worms expressing TBK1 have about the same lifespan as the worms expressing the wild type 15Q uh, hunting protein. So now that we have this effect, we were interested to know exactly the mechanism of actions for TBK1. And the question we wanted to know is whether TBK1 is acting, uh, at what stage along this inclusion pathway is TBK1 acting on? And since we're focusing on inclusion, we thought, could it be acting on, on the fibrils or on the inclusions once they have formed? So the idea was TBK1 phosphorylate the monomer. And the question we did not know is whether TBK1 can phosphorylate preformed aggregates and promotes their clearance, or does it really act at the monomer level? And what you can see here is that uh, one thing that we found that was interesting is TBK1 inhibition was actually phosphorylation independent in the sense that when we overexpress the mutant exon 1 having S13 and S16 residues mutated to alanine, which cannot be phosphorylated, we saw the same reduction in, hand, in, in inclusion level, suggesting that this effect is not really phosphor dependent on the phosphorylation uh, of the monomer or the fibers. Moreover, we can show that in vitro, if we take Huntington fibrils and we add to be TBK1, that t neither TBK1 or IKK beta can phosphorylate preformed fibrils. So these are pure fibrils from, prepared from recombinant Huntington. And as you can see here, neither of these kinase, once the fibril form is, can, can uh, phosphorylate them. So then we asked the question whether TBK1 may be acting and phosphorylating the inclusions and promoting their clearance. For this assay, what we did is we express mutant Huntington in HEC, uh, HEC cells. And after 48 hours, when the inclusions are formed, then we transfect with TBK1 to see whether it is not with, 
promote the clearance of preformed inclusion. And for that, we monitor up to 96 hours. And what you could see here is that introducing TP TBK1, once the, once the inclusions are formed, have no effect in inclusion formation. We don't see any reduction in inclusion formation. And what we see here by Western plot is that indeed TBK1 phosphorylate the soluble form of Huntington, but has no effect on reducing the amount of Huntington aggregate as determined by uh, this filter assay here. You can see that in this case, unlike before, every time we add TBK1, we don't see a reduction in Huntington aggregate. What this means is basically that TBK1 does not phosphorylate or reduce the levels of Huntington aggregates once they are formed. And this is a quick summary of this section is to say that TBK1 phosphorylate Huntington in vitro at both residues. However, in cells, we can confirm that TBK phosphorylate Huntington at only S13. An overexpression of TBK1 increases the lo nuclear localization of Huntington and reduces the cytotoxic effect of mutant Huntington in primary striatal neurons and C. elegans model. However, this effect seems to be independent of exon 1 phosphorylation of uh, MT17 or S13. And this we can confirm because even the effect of Huntington on reducing the levels of soluble Huntington is, uh, we looked at whether Huntington acts at early stage at the, at the level of the monomer. And what you can see here is that when we overexpress hunting uh, TBK1, we always see a reduction in soluble Huntington. We also see a reduction in IK when we do that, uh, overexpress IKK beta, but the level of reduction is always higher for TBK1. And we see the same level of reduction in Huntington levels when we express uh, TBK1 and the S13, S16 mutants or T3A. Uh, mutant. And that suggests that TK, TBK1 coexpression reduces the level independent of phosphorylation of Huntington in uh, these uh, three res residues, but suggests that the beneficial effect that we're seeing for TBK1 are mediated by its ability to reduce the level of uh, Huntington protein in the cells. And it is known, well documented, that TBK1 plays an important role in mediating and regulating different aspects of autophagy and has been shown to do, sort of clear, promote the clearance of a number of proteins that are uh, sort of aggregating proteins linked to neurodegeneration disease, neurodegenerative diseases. Therefore, we thought that we would look whether these effects of TBK1 are mediated by its effect on autophagy and autophagy-mediated clearance of Huntington. Indeed, when we co-express Huntington and TBK1 in the presence of inhibitors of either the proteasome of autophagy, you could see when we have DMSO, we see Huntington reduction in, in, in uh, TBK1 mediated reduction of Huntington aggregation as evident here. And the same when we add the prote proteasome inhibitors, but when we add inhibitors of autophagy, we see that they block the effect of TBK, the ability of TBK1 to reduce Huntington levels, suggesting that co-expression of TBK1 is so somehow promoting the clearance of uh, soluble Huntington. And we have, we could see also evidence for this by the fact that TBK1 overexpression increases LC3 influx, suggesting increased autophagy based clearance in these cells. Now, to be able to unlink uh, the phosphorylation and phosphorylation independent ef effect, what we did is we know that uh, TBK1 interacts with many of its autophagy adapters like P62 and optoneurin and phosphorylate this protein, and that this interaction is mediated by this uh, sort of coil-coil domain in its C terminus. So, what, uh, so TBK1 you know, phosphorylate these proteins interacts and up in phosphorylation, it facilitates the recruitment of the ubiquitinated cargo for degradation. And what we can show is that when we mutate, when we remove the CC2 domain, then TPK1 is no longer capable of interacting or phosphorylating these autophagy adapters as evident in this Western block, and that should block the clearance of hunt uh, Huntington. So basically the idea here is that if we in the case of wild type TBK1, we phosphorylate the protein and in a TBK1 
uh, autophagy sort of mediated process promote the clearance uh, of Huntington and reduce its uh, soluble levels. On um, the case of the mutant, it still should still be able, since it has the kinase domain, to phosphorylate Huntington. But in this case, since the mutants cannot act on autophagy, promote autophagy, it should have no effect on Huntington levels and aggregation. So we tested this by comparing the effect of TPK1 or the TPK1 deleted mutants and both phosphorylation and soluble and aggregate Huntington levels. And what you can see here is that both TPK1 and the mutant are capable of phosphorylating the protein. However, uh, in the case of uh, in the and both in the case of uh, reducing the level of soluble proteins we can see that only mainly TBK1, both proteins are also able to reduce the, le the level, but when we block phosphorylation at 13, S13 and S16, the effect on Huntington lowering and effect on Huntington aggregation is abolished in the case of the mutants. They see that the mutants, we can see the same level of aggregation for the mutants of the kinase deficient mutants. Well, as well as the same of level of soluble protein. What this shows is that overexpression of this mutants does not inhibit the aggregation of the S13 and S16, but it does inhibit the aggregation of the wild type, suggesting that once we abolish the TBK1 uh, autophagy-driven process, that the inhibition of aggregation becomes dependent on the phosphorylation state of the protein, which the, you know, in, uh, allows us to provide very clear evidence that the phosphorylation of Huntington at this residue is actually sufficient to block its aggregation in cells. This is just a quick summary of this experiment. What you could see is that in the case of this deleted mutant, we can phosphorylate the protein. And by virtue that the protein is phosphorylated, we can block its aggregation, but it, there is no effect on Huntington levels. And however, when we, in this case, have the uh, serine to alanine mutations, that this, mut this uh, TBK1 mutant no longer promotes clearance of this protein. We show that in the case of the wild type protein, TBK1 phosphorylates the protein, and by virtue of simply phosphorylating the protein, as we shown in vitro, blocks aggregation and inclusion formation and at the same time promotes its clearance, which has the net effect of lowering Huntington. So both blocking aggregation and lowering Huntington have the net effect of, uh, you know, sort of inhibiting inclusion formation and protecting against Huntington in those toxicity. So finally, you know, what does this mean is our data are consistent with previous studies showing that autophagy is impaired in Huntington and contributes to increased mutant Huntington accumulation and aggregation. And also consist, consistent with previous studies shown that upregulation of autophagy has beneficial effect in several models of Huntington. It has been suggested that in HD, cargo proteins are not efficiently loaded in autophagosomes. And this is a defect that must first be corrected before mutant Huntington can, can take place efficiently. And we believe that TBK1 provides an effective mechanism for doing this. What's next, obviously, is that we still, uh, there is still a lot to, know, to, to figure out about the mechanism of how TBK1 re regulates the clearance of mutant Huntington and protects against toxicity. And also to test the effect of targeting TBK1 in various preclinical uh, Huntington models. We believe that these studies will provide more insight into the potential clinical benefits of targeting TBK1, mostly through TBK, TBK1 activation in Huntington and potentially other neurodegenerative diseases. TBK1 is a kinase that plays important roles in innate immunity and neuroinflammation. And neuroinflammation has emerged as a key player in neurodegenerative diseases. So this is a TBK1 TBK neuroinflammation, neurodegeneration, uh, sort of access we believe is an important one to look at. And obviously the ultimate goal is to find ways to modulate TBK1 uh, levels or act activity to achieve this beneficial effect. And in this case, one has to look at TBK1 activators 
And very little is known about mechanisms of activating TBK1. Although, you know, and uh, it is known that TBK1 acts, you know, exerts its effect through interacting with different complexes and therefore potentially, you know, cell type dependent targeting of a specific TBK1 complexes could offer uh, some unique opportunities to, to upregulate its level in specific cells or neurons. And this makes TBK1 a new member of the family of kinases that have been implicated in neurodegenerative diseases and are, are sort of potential target for therapy. And with this, I'd like to end by the acknowledgement, acknowledging the people of control contributed to the work. As I said, this work was led by Raman Hajj, but it would have not been possible without many of the people, our collaborators listed here. And I thank you for your attention and look forward to taking questions during the panel discussion. Thank you.